Well, hello everyone from Austin, Texas, and thank you for joining us today. And welcome to our webinar with the Texas Oral History Association. My name is Leah DeForest. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the communications manager with Texas Digital Library. I'm also joined today by TDL's Deputy Director, Courtney Muma, and our conference planner and administrative associate, Alex Suarez. I'm gonna start with a little housekeeping and a Zoom orientation. So please keep your microphones muted again if you aren't speaking. We do hope you'll use chat box to say hello to us and let others know you're here. Uh, we invite you to use that chat box to make comments and share resources throughout today's presentations. And chats are also where we'll share out links related to some of the information we're talking about today. If you have a question, go ahead and type it into chat and we'll have time for questions at the end of the presentation. And live captioning has been enabled. You can view the live captioning, <clears throat> excuse me, by clicking on the closed caption button on your Zoom toolbar. And finally, this webinar is being recorded. We're going to publish slides and recordings on our website and in the TDL repository. And that also means if you don't wanna be a part of the recording, please turn your cameras off and you can talk with us in, in chat if you prefer not to talk over your mic. We have a community agreement. We at TDL and the Texas Oral History Association are dedicated to providing an experience for everyone that is free from all forms of harassment and inclusive of all people. We ask that everyone here today be considerate and respectful in speech and action. Uh, we ask you attempt collaboration before conflict, uh, that you refrain from demeaning, discriminatory, or harassing behavior and speech, and please be mindful of your environment and all of our participants today. And just one more reminder, this is being recorded. We're gonna publish slides and recordings and share them with you all in attendance and everyone who registered. And we'll be posting these on our website, on YouTube, and in our repository. And finally, TDL is grateful to our members, many of whom are here today. We are so appreciative that you put your trust in Texas Digital Library to provide essential library infrastructure and services like digital preservation, digital repository hosting, tools for managing ETDs and research data, and support for open educational resources and metadata aggregation. We invite any institution interested in becoming part of our consortium to reach out to us. We need you and your energy and expertise to continue growing the digital library community in this region. And we love to invite you to connect with our amazing, fun and brilliant community of librarians and archivists. And so now on with the show. So today's presenters are Jenna Heath, Associate Dean of Arts and Humanities, Associate Professor of Journalism and Digital Media and Coordinator of Journalism and Digital Media Program at St. Edwards University. And Megan Firestone is the Head of Special Collections and Archives at Southwestern University. Jenna and Megan are gonna present on strategies to bridge the gaps between the archivists and oral historians. And I'm gonna launch a quick poll so we can learn a little bit about you. As I'm doing that, Jenna, we'll stop sharing our screen and turn things over to you. Okay. Go ahead and launch that poll. We'd love to know a bit about you. Tell us about your role in the library or on your campus. You can select as many as apply. This is anonymous. We just kind of wanted to get a sense of who's out there with us today. And I'll uh, let the poll run for another probably 30 seconds and then uh, share the results. This is good. We're split mostly between archivists and librarians. I'm gonna go ahead and end poll. Looks like most everyone's had a chance to take it. And I'll share the results. And over to you, Jenna. Is Alex advancing the slides? Yeah. So I am Jenna Heath and I'm a uh, new, relatively new oral historian. I started this project as part of my sabbatical in 2015, 2016. Um, we could move ahead. Okay, here we go. 
my project focuses, it's called Our China Stories, and it focuses on the stories of adoptees from China. Um, I did about 100 interviews. The project's ongoing, but I had this really robust amount of time, obviously, during that year to do, uh, to travel and to interview people really from not only the United States, but also in some other countries. And um, in the course of this work, I collaborated with my colleague here, Megan Firestone, who was then at St. Edwards University. And um, we're gonna talk both of us a little bit about how that collaboration worked. I will say just to start it off that I was completely a neophyte when it came to collaborating. This was a, um, with library staff and with an archivist. And it was such a wonderful experience that Megan and I continue to collaborate, <laughs> even though we're now at different institutions. Um, we worked together on an NEH grant application for um, digital preservation and archiving of the collection, which we didn't get, but got relatively far in terms of um, encouragement from NEH. And that led me to um, a further collaboration and um, getting to know a couple of the people at UNT uh, libraries. And the collection is also up on the portal to Texas history there. And we'll talk more about that as we go on. So next slide, please. Hi, I'm Megan Firestone. I am head of special collections and archives at Southwestern University. I started here in January of 2019. Uh, prior to this position, I was at St. Ed's um, with Jenna, um, where I was the special collections librarian. Um, and then I've also been an archivist at Myriad RBM, which if you're not familiar with it, uh, it is a biotech firm. Um, and then I was also an Air Force historian. Something Jenna and I wanted to kind of talk about is, you know, when you collaborate sometimes, or you work on a campus or anywhere, you may not be aware of everybody's backgrounds. Um, and so, for example, when Jenna met with me, she didn't really know that, that I was also a trained oral historian. Um, I have an MA in public history, which includes training in oral history. Um, I was trained by a great oral historian, Dan Utley, which I know some people will know. Um, and so I've done oral histories for the Air Force. Uh, when I worked at Tarleton Law Library, I did oral histories. Um, so I have a great love affair of oral histories. Um, so that was kind of helpful in our collaboration is having that background. Um, but we'll talk a little bit more about kind of where archivists and librarians can come in to help with projects. Um, next slide, please. Or also I'll launch the poll. Hmm. Okay, I think I launched the poll. Okay, there we go. Okay, give it a couple more seconds. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll. Looks like most, or we're evenly split between worked on and assisted. Okay. Okay. All you, Jenna. <laughs> okay, um, so the way we met was that, um, I started working on this project, was approved for the sabbatical. And really, this was my introduction to oral history. I am, before I entered academia um, in 2008, I was a working journalist for 20 years. I was a reporter and editor. So I had a lot of experience with interviewing, obviously, and encountering new people and, and talking to people about their stories. Um, I really had to learn through training and, you know, and exposure to colleagues with expertise, obviously, um, that oral history interviewing is different. And to really think about and understand better the craft of um, an art of oral history. And I am so taken with it. And I think I hope have 
develop some facility with it. Um, I'm actually now on the a board member at the Texas Oral History Association. So this project and this collaboration led to a lot of um, satisfying and interesting things that I hadn't anticipated in the first place. Um, the collection, as I said, features interviews with 100 adoptees from China, their families, if they wanted, if the adoptees wanted their families involved, they were. And um, in one case, a, a birth mother um, who I interviewed um, using WeChat messaging app um, in China and whose identity is obscured. Um, all the subjects in this project have the option of using um, you know, middle names or, or not being identified by name or you know, not having photos, whatever they want or don't want is up to them in terms of the identifying information that's included in the project. Um, there are photos, video, videos, and written narratives by the adoptees. Um, I also transcripts. So um, when you go on to the Our China Story site, you can, you can read the transcript, you can listen to the interview, you can watch the video really all or whatever you really wanna do. Next slide, please. This is the team. I, I realized I was going to need a team when I started and I reached out to Megan and Megan is going to have to remind me about our initial, our initial co conversation. Um, I learned, and I feel naive saying this, that, you know, we had so much expertise at the library. So Megan's archival experience, her, and then, you know, the added benefit of her training in oral history, um, the designer who designed the Omeka site, um, Marcos Hernandez, I did very minimal editing. The oral historians here will know that, you know, there's, you know, there's a kind of no editing policy. Um, we really just really cleaned up when things were distorted. And Matt Largy from KUT, some of you may, be, may know Matt, um, is a is a project editor and a wonderful um, audio journalist at KUT. A freelance photographer came with me to take pictures. Some of the photos are provided by subjects. Um, we had a translator uh, who's a colleague, Shan Shan Zhang, who's at Shanghai University. She did translation of interviews with people in China who weren't, you know, my Mandarin is very, very rudimentary. <laughs> and um, so when when people didn't speak English, Shan Shan helped. And then, of course, met um, Jake Mangum at UNT, dig, at the digital library there, um, as we moved along with the NEH grant application. And the actually, the program officer at NEH pointed me to the portal, and so um, to Texas history and to the work at UNT. So this is sort of how the team developed. Next slide, please. This is what the site looks like. This is just a screenshot of kind of what you see when you land. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, participants, usually I would go to people's homes. Um, um, Steph Campos, a photographer, would come with me, obviously, if people were interested in having photos with their stories. I interviewed international participants um, in Barcelona, Australia, China, China, not Skype, but in other countries uh, by Skype. Um, and I continue to collect oral histories as, as um, the site also allows um, adoptees to upload their own stories. If they wanna just sort of do this, they can do it themselves. I get a notification and then I can take a look at the story, contact the storyteller, you know, talk about consent forms and all of that. And um, so I tried as much as possible in this to, 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 to be a kind of facilitator um, and to make the storytelling as direct as possible by the people who's, who's, who are telling the stories without getting in the way. Next slide, please. Um, so I thought I'd show you a couple of just kind of snippets here. Um, these two young women, uh, Selena Kopinski and Sarah Heath, who is not related to me, so far as we know, um, after they, their story appeared on Our China Stories, and a while later, um, 
Selena's mom got in touch and said, oh, you got to turn on CBS Sunday morning. The girls are on CBS Sunday morning. And it was on a story about twins. And theirs was featured as a story about twins who were separated, which is common in the adoption system, the international adoption system in China, which we, you, is not something you know uh, we knew um, until, or really I understood until I got into doing this work. Um, and I should say that my initial interest in this subject was fueled. I am, I am the mother of a, of a daughter who was born in China and adopted from China. And she was, she helps me a lot with the project. She's 15 now. So one of the things I learned as I was going through is that um, often twins were separated and um, sent to different families internationally and um, without, without the families being told without anyone understanding this. And there is a lot of um, work going on now. Um, a lot of connecting on social media around DNA. And we have people like Selena and Sarah who found each other through DNA testing. Um, next slide, please. Uh, Sarah grew up in Nashville. Selena grew up in New York City. Uh, it turns out through the sheer happenstance of life, which constantly is hitting me in the face as I do this project, that Selena and I have a very, Selena's parents and I have a very close mutual friend. <laughs> so the whole thing is just, um, Sarah went to Georgetown, Selena went to Case Western, and um, they were mistaken for one another, basically. Um, at Georgetown, a friend of Selena's from home spotted Sarah online when she was registering for a class and thought he was seeing his old childhood friend and set in motion this whole series of events that ultimately led to the two contacting each other by Facebook Messenger and agreeing to have DNA tests and found that they are sisters. Um, and the oral history is linked here and you can, it's a, there's quite a long conversation and there's a YouTube video and you can, you can listen to them talk about what this experience has been like. They're in their twenties and they're getting to know each other now. Next slide, please. Um, this is uh, the story of Willa Mae Curland. Willa Mae Curland and Charlotte Cotter met in an adoptee conference a couple of years before they decided to spend a summer traveling to China and seeing if they couldn't find birth parents or birth relatives. They didn't have much hope that they would, but they thought they would try. Charlotte went to Yale and studied Mandarin and is fluent in Mandarin. Awilla grew up in the Bay Area and they traveled together and got in touch with me. They heard about my project through these sort of very extensive adoptee social media networks. And I've been really active with the project on social media. So that's kind of a whole other conversation here. But um, and they got in touch with me and they said, we want to document our story on our China stories. Is that okay with you as it's happening? And I said, sure, great. And I was in Seattle on a week long vacation with my family. Willa and Charlotte had not even left the country yet. And Willa got in touch with me to tell me that she thinks they had found her foster parents by posting information about her finding date and time and some of the information in her adoption, adoption documents and photographs on Chinese social media. And in fact, that did turn out to lead her to the couple that fostered her. Um, and this is sometimes common in areas where there isn't a, a big adoption um, orphanage system. You're with a foster family. Um, Willa and Charlotte met the foster family. So these are people who took care of Willa for the first year of life. And we found out later um, in the course of all this, all documented in the collection, wanted to adopt her. We're very, very um, intent on adopting her and tried to hide her from the family planning officials before her adoptive parents could get to China. The, the international adoption was already in motion. Um, and they were threatened with prosecution if they did not relinquish Willa. Willa learned all of this in the course of this trip. Her foster mother provided the documentation and the copy of the legal notice. Um, so I thought if you might want to hear a little bit of their reunion, if we could play that. Oh. 
Charlotte is translating. You can't, she's shooting to This is this is dad. This Baba is what is what her foster mom is saying to her. That's Charlotte. Okay, um, next slide, please. Uh, I'll move quickly so we can get to collaboration. Um, okay, so the, the, I built this site initially. Um, part of the team was an undergraduate, a student at UT, who um, was in the journalism program there, but got interested in uh, computers and had a real talent with coding and with building. And um, a colleague of mine um, recommended him. And so initially we built a site, he built it, Miles built it. Miles graduated and works at Google now. And, you know, he's going to run the world while I'm still a lowly college professor, but I'm glad I got a little moment of his time. And um, the site was fine as long as it went until it got, um, the images were hosted by Amazon and it got hacked. And so, you know, I was suddenly dealing with I was suddenly dealing with technical problems. I, I'm pretty good with this stuff, but I really didn't have the time or the resources to, 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 to kind of unwind. And I knew that I needed institutional support. And so um, once I, I, I said goodbye to the site and started um, to work with uh, Marcos Hernandez, who unfortunately isn't at St. Edwards anymore, recently went to a job for a healthcare, uh, computer job for a healthcare outfit, but he built the Omeka collection. And I should say, this was my introduction to Omeka. So, you know, like here you have these, these professor people who, some of whom have a lot of understanding of what goes on over there at the library, and some of whom have really need an education. And this entire experience has been a wonderful education for me. I, I, I have to say that I could not be doing this project it is a full collaboration with archiving and with um, the talents and skills of people who do digital library work. And I'm a huge proponent of more support for digital library work at universities. Um, the collection is, I now understand how to use Omeka. I have some facility with it. I can help manage the back end a little bit. Um, and of course, um, the collection is also on the portal to Texas history, which I'm very grateful to UNT libraries for. Next slide, please. This is what it looks like on the portal. The portal has oral histories, I'm sure, as you all know. And um, so it's great that, you know, people can find it there. Next slide, please. Here's a little bit about the portal if you're not familiar with it. I just am such a huge fan. I think it's a wonderful. Um, and then at a Toha conference, I heard um, more about the portal, learn more about it. And I was even more excited about it. Um, Omeka is a lot less difficult than I thought it would be. I'm going to look at questions in a minute um, and I'm going to let Megan talk about the mechanics of Omeka. But for me, as a, as a non-trained person, somebody who is, I do teach digital stuff all the time in journalism and digital media and work, I've been working with digital, you know, tools for and technologies for years, but I didn't know Omeka. It's really not hard to learn once, but if you have a collaboration with a colleague who can teach you and can, part of it is understanding the way Omeka thinks about things. And, and, and if you're, if you think in archival terms, you know, you're going to understand your brain is going to work in an Omeka way but more immediately. So it really helps to have someone with the archival brain helping you with it. <laughs> Next slide, please. 
Uh, we presented, I've presented at the Alliance for the Study of Adoption and Culture in Minneapolis. That was a biennial conference, um, a very, you know, wonderful conference. A 2018 at the Toha Conference at Texas A&M is how I was really introduced to Toha, which has just been an, an enormous and um, enormously just satisfying um, relationship for me, wonderful group of colleagues who I'm just just so glad that I'm working with now. Um, and then Je um, Megan and Jake and I presented, I asked Megan and Jake if they would be interested in collaborating on a um, discussion at the 2019 Toha conference, which we had at St. Edwards, um, on this, this theme of collaboration among uh, smaller institutions, because one of the reasons I'm able to work on my project is, is collaboration outside of silos of expertise on one campus and also with other campuses. So I just am so anti-silo. I hate it. It's one of the things about academia that I really hate. I like a lot of things about it. And I'm happy, but I wish we were not all so siloed. So part of what I would say about this is, is breaking out of those silos and breaking out of your sort of way of thinking about you're in this box and that's the only box you're going to be in is you can just do so much better work and you can maximize resources at a time when it's really resources are hard. So um, this is kind of what we've done so far in terms of sharing the project. Next slide, please. Uh, I just want to get a, give a plug for the upcoming uh, Toha conference, which will be at Trinity University on September 24th and 25th. Uh, feel free to reach out to me. There's my email or to baylor.edu, you know, Toha, and, um, you know, I can point you in the right direction for more information about Toha and about the conference. And I'm going to stop talking now. <laughs> Next slide, please. Okay, thank you, Jenna. I'm going to kind of talk about the archives library side of the collaboration and areas of kind of where the bridging the gap happens. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so first, I kind of wanted to give the involvement overview from kind of my side. Um, so Jenna reached out to me in 2017. Um, I remember there's a coffee shop on St. Edwards and we met and we chatted and you know, that's where we really kind of started seeing where all of these areas that, you know, I could come in and help with the project and where the library might be able to kind of help with the project. Because um, I know one of the things that Jenna was really worried about is what happens if something was to happen to her and what would be taking care of the project. Um, and so that's where we really kind of talked about, you know, digital preservation and places that we could put the content. Um, and so as part of our thing is that's where we kind of discussed what the um, role and function of the archives is at a academic university or at any institute library and also different digital platforms. Um, I love knowing about diff different digital platforms and I call them kind of like my digital toolkit uh, to kind of figure out what works the best for the project we're trying to accomplish. Um, my one I use the most is Omeka, and I know I saw a question in there, and I think it got out a little bit, but Omeka is a, can be a free, um, free like a puppy um, product um, that you can use. Um, you can either get Omeka.net, um, which they'll host for you, and you can pay um, to do smaller projects, or like for us, when we, when we were at St. Edwards or even here at Southwestern, we have a different version of Omeka, which allows us a little bit more functionality. Um, and there are two versions of Omeka now. There's Omeka and Omeka S. They function a little differently. I'm still trying to wrap my brain around Omeka S. Um, but Omeka is a really great tool for doing digital collections, digital projects, um, and it doesn't really require a lot of IT know-how, which is what I like and I think worked well for Jenna's project is that it well it really helped navigate that kind of, you know, we're gonna help set it up, but eventually kind of adding more items and things like that would still fall under Jenna and she'd have to kind of help with some of that. Um, and then also I was part of the grant application in the sense of helping figure out a digital preservation plan for the materials. Um, and just also how would the materials be housed since really they weren't going to come into the university archives as they were not under our collection development policy um, 
and the project, it was a faculty project. So we kind of had to navigate how was that going to work? Next slide, please. Okay, so I kind of wanted to talk about, um, you know, where can archivists and librarians, um, I'm gonna kind of put us all together under one wheelhouse, um, talk about how we can help with kind of bridging this gap of projects. One is our expertise to projects. Um, we have a lot of different things that we handle and know about from metadata, which is one of the things that we helped Jenna with was coming up with keywords and tagging and just how to kind of sort the information. Digital scholarship, we do quite a bit of digital scholarship with different projects, different products, um, and then also working on preservation. Um, and so we kind of have a, you know, all these different things in, that we do on top of our normal kind of just teaching library sessions, helping with research. There's all these other expertise that we can help with. Um, we can also connect to other services like the Portal to Texas History. Um, we, at St. Edwards, we use the portal for a newspaper project. Here at Southwestern, we use the portal to house all of our digital collections um, or digital items. We use Omeka to do our digital exhibits. And then we can also talk and work through infrastructure or software needs like digital platforms, storage, and equipment. Um, so especially if you're getting started on a project, the, collaborating and talking with your library or others on your campus can really help you set your project up and figure out what you might need. For example, here at Southwestern, we actually have a room set up for audio. So you can do hit oral history or audio interviews in the room in the library, and it's got all of the audio equipment, the microphones, everything. Um, NPR interviews have been done in that room, things like that. So it's there's all these equipment and things that you might be able to take advantage of and use that are housed in these things. Um, Next slide, please. Okay, so I think I talked through mine pretty quickly. Um, so I'm gonna go back and answer a quick question on Omeka and OHMS. Uh, the Oral History Metadata Synthesizer is a plugin that you can use with Omeka. Um, we did not use it for Jenna's project. Um, one of the biggest things we did with Omeka is actually try to figure out how we could make Omeka not look like Omeka. Um, a lot of the default themes you'll recognize from institution to institution, and so that's where Marcos was great, is he really went in and figured out how to kind of theme our China stories to look very much just like that is our China stories, and um, Omeka is the back end just getting all the information in. Um, the oral history metadata synthesizer is actually something I'm playing with here for one of our oral history projects that a faculty is working on here. Um, and we're going to kind of work with that on the um, setting up the oral histories. And what it does is it will sync your transcript to your audio. So I will let Jenna talk about her lessons. Yeah, we each kind of had some lessons, so I'll do this. I will say this, I do want to say, I said in the chat, I want to give Megan another shout out because she initiated that portal relationship. I was the faculty advisor to the student newspaper for 10 years and she was getting it digitized and working with the folks at UNT to get it up on the portal. And so, um, you know, just really a wonderful project um, in and of itself. Um, lessons. Collaborate early with archivists and library professionals. I cannot um, encourage this more. And I guess what I would add to that is to understand that you are necessarily going to have different vocabularies. You're going to speak different languages for a while. And it's going to feel a little disorienting the way it does when you get to a certain point in your career and you're used to sort of being the expert in the room and you get uncomfortable with not knowing things and with, with being honest about not knowing things. I think that's just sort of a curse of, of adulthood and professional life at a certain point. I really had to become a student of, of what my, my, my archiving and digital library colleagues do. I needed to stop and take a breath and understand what is the vocabulary here? Because there were times in the early conversations where it was like, we were talking and we were literally just using different terms. And so 
you know, and some of you asked, what's Omeka? Well, of course, that's a question I was asking. And um, I was also, you know, very anxiously involved in this, you know, we got involved in this NEH grant process, and which we were really, I was encouraged to do by the folks at St. Edwards who do our grants, and um, they were very supportive and wonderful. And you all know, it's hard to get grants in the humanities. It's really tough these days. But it was, um, it really required me to let go. I couldn't write the part of this proposal that made a case for digital preservation. You know, I don't have the expertise to do that. You know, and in the beginning, I'll be frank, you know, I thought, oh, I've, I was trying to sort of control everything. And it was when I let go of that, and I said, okay, you know, I've got to, I've got to turn this over. And, um, and acknowledge that, you know, I just don't have the expertise to really write this part of the proposal. We still need true digital archiving and preservation at the Monday Library at St. Edwards. This is true, I think, for many academic libraries. Digital archiving and preservation, as you know, is not putting things on the cloud. And so that's a whole other area that I've become really fascinated in. And if I ever go back to school, I'm going back to for information and library science so I can you know, do this all the time because I just find it so fascinating. Um, I found with this project, think in phases, plan carefully. If anyone undertaking a major project, you're gonna set yourself up for a lot of stress and emotional disappointment if you think you can get things done in six months. This project started in 2015. I'm still working on it. <laughs> and as Megan said, one of the most immediate concerns I had was, what if I get hit by a bus? I think that was probably like the first thing I said to you, except for, you know, do you want a latte? Um, I was so worried. What would happen to this material that people had shared with me? Some very emotional and personal information that they had shared with me in good faith how could it be preserved? I suddenly became aware of how ephemeral digital materials are. And we all know how important this is as libraries become more digital, that we all kind of face up to this and think about it. So when I started to think in chunks of time and to plan carefully and collaborate more openly and to make myself more of a student, I think things started to work you know, better. And finally, I mean, see setbacks as opportunities. I was bitterly disappointed not to get the NEH grant. I had had a wonderful relationship with the program officer at NEH. He was very optimistic. He was trying not to tip his hand, but, but then I also understood, you know, very few people get an NEH grant like this right off the bat first hand. I wasn't coming from Harvard. You know, there were there were things I had to be realistic about. I still had to scrape myself out of bed, you know, and kind of have a talk with myself. And what the NEH program officer did do was really, really encourage me to deepen my relationship with the portal and with my colleagues in Texas. And that helped me, you know, really now have an infrastructure of colleagues around digital library work and oral history. So keep going, don't give up and don't, don't let the big disappointments keep you down. Just, just keep slugging at it and, and keep collaborating is what I would say. Next slide, please. Okay, so the lessons from kind of my side is, as Jenna mentioned, the discipline specific language that we sometimes don't realize that we're using um, and that we need to be aware of. And sometimes there is a little bit of education that has to happen in order for us to really get into the collaboration and really start understanding. And so one of the things I wanna say is if you feel like there's frustration points starting to happen is to think about, have you really sat down and thought about the language that you're using that you might be thinking, oh, they should understand this and they may not because it's not, you know, not something that they do day to day. Um, and so I think that's one of the things that helped is Jenna and I sat down at one point and finally said, okay, this is what I mean when I say this. And it really helped kind of get us through some of the just hurdles that we were starting to face early on in the project because we, we were hitting those walls of, we were trying to come at the same point, but we we're using very different language. Um, the other thing is really trying to kind of push the boundaries of what you can use. Um, one of the big things we were trying to figure out is that something that we could use that fit the budget, which was 
like zero dollars at the time we were starting. <laughs> um, and so we we were really trying to figure out how we could push. And what we chose was Omeka, but there's a lot of different software packages out there and things that you can done uh, do that I keep, I stay up on and I look at and figure out the different ways we might be able to use. Um, and then also what really kind of stuck with me and I learned from this is the fact that we weren't doing great outreach. We weren't telling the campus, hey, the library can help you with this. Um, or this is what the archives can do. You know, the archives, while we are working to preserve the materials in the collection, we also can lend our expertise for projects and collaboration. And we weren't doing a great job of really promoting that. Um, and so we really changed how we started doing outreach and talking and just really trying to promote the services that we could offer um, for different projects. So those are some of the lessons that I took away from this project that have stuck with me um, in thinking about working on few other collaborations that I've done since this project. Do we have another slide? Next slide. <laughs> I gotta remember. I think that's it. I think that's, that's it. it. So maybe we should take questions. Wow, Jenna and Megan, <laughs> thank you so much. I feel like I learned too much for my brain on a Monday, but I oh. really just want to commend you for just sharing your challenges and vulnerabilities, uh, your failures along the way, and uh, just being really open about your need for a team and, and collaborators. It just seems like you had a model for communication and collaboration that'd be really strong to follow. And I have questions for both of you, and, and I just want to invite everyone. We're in. Um, uh, Q&A discussion mode. We have about 15 minutes left. You're all invited if you would like to turn on your cameras and join in the fray. If you do need to peel off, just a reminder, we'll share links out to the uh, recording and slides and everything for today. But um, so I do have a question for you, Jenna, and, and I know you touched on this, but I was wondering if you could talk kind of specifically about how working with Megan and or working with an archivist maybe changed your, your approach to a project or uh, steps in your process? Well, I think it, it, it completely changed it because I had been thinking of this as this website, you know, that I, I thought of it as a, you know, I had this airy notion of a digital collection, but I didn't really understand what that meant. And so I think once I started working with Megan, I had a much clearer idea of, oh, wait a minute, kind of technically what this means. And for instance, you know, and this was also true with oral history that I, this is a place where the two met, you know, as they do a lot on the project, the role of transcripts, how important transcripts were both from the oral history perspective, but also from the archiving perspective, how did I, how did I get them? How did I, you know, there's lots of discussions around transcripts and transcription and that we could have, but, you know, where were they going to go? Um, Megan really helped me with, you know, things like consent and how was I going to keep track of the consents? You know, I actually, the consents are now uploaded on the background of the Omeka site. They're not public, but I just put everything there so that I just have a repository for all the material and when I, the stuff that is not published, obviously is I check on publish and people can see it, but I know it's there. So I think that I also understood that there was a full range of things that um, Megan really helped me understand thinking about digital archiving and, and, and preservation. And, um, and that could be frustrating because I realized that you know, that's something that we really, really need. And that is, is resource wise and everything else can be, can be tough to, can be tough to convince when there are so many other resources at liberal arts universities and campuses that are, that are elusive, but it, it sort of, sort of made me slow down and think in pieces, not just, oh, I've got to get the interview. You know, I was thinking in the oral history head, that's how I was thinking. I was just only thinking of the oral history. And this was going to be kind of this place where I put everything. 
But what did that really mean? It, it's, it's much more dynamic than that. So I would say it informed everything about the way I started to think about the project. And once we were looking at Omeka, I was really like, oh, okay. Cause it does make your head think differently about the, the material, how you have it, where it goes, what function it plays um, in the way that you're presenting the material, what you're holding back, what you're making public. So I don't know if that's enough of an answer, but I would say changed it all. <laughs> I think that's a great answer, Jenna. And just, um, I, I mean, just one of the first things you said was, well, I was thinking it was just going to be a website. And then you introduced the archivist and she's like, hmm. Yeah, a bit more than that. Yeah, a bit more to it. So, um, but I, I appreciate all those things you point out that maybe those of us who work in the field or work with archivists or archives kind of miss those very big basic uh, ways of thinking. And, you know, so uh, to Megan, I would ask the same question. I'm sure you have advised other faculty or, or other folks with their, their massive or minuscule projects and just how did Jenna's approach change the way you might approach this work? Well, I think, you know, one of the biggest things was just, you know, meeting a faculty member who didn't really have an understanding of the archives or the library. And I was like, well, we need to fix this. We need to make sure, you know, I, I'm also like Jenna, I don't like silos. I don't, I want, my ideal is everything should, we should be sharing information um, and lending our expertise as we can to projects so that we can form these great teams and have these great projects. Um, and so, but meeting her, that really started kind of percolating that, you know, just how are we presenting what we can do to our campus constituents and to the community and just, you know, how, you know, do they know what we can offer? Can we, you know, and then also having to, you know, it's a lesson I learned when I worked at the, with the Air Force is the Air Force runs on acronyms. They love their acronyms. So when you first start working for the United States Air Force, you have no idea what half the time anybody says in a conversation because the entire sentence is an acronym. Um, and from that, I'd learned that you really should try to, when you meet somebody for the first time, you should really try to use a common shared language. Um, and the, you know, the problem was I'd gotten kind of in my archivist head again. And, you know, so I had to really kind of back out of that again when working with Jenna. And that reminded me that when you're first starting some of these projects, you need to really make sure that you're laying it out in a language that is understandable, but through all, um, and not our very discipline specific, um, you know, cause there was terms for digital preservation that I was piping off to Jenna and I, I mean, she just, I think looked at me and was like, what, what are you talking, like, this is a foreign language. Um, and so I think that's kind of one of the biggest things that I learned is just really also taking a pause. Um, I tend to like to just throw everything, like just dive right in and present, which can be overwhelming. So that's where I've learned that take a pause and, you know, really listen to what's being asked and then saying, okay, this is where we can help in very basic terms, not like, let's dive right in. We're going to start this project today. Really just pause and learn that this is kind of a process of going through a timeline of let's have our initial conversations and then build on that conversation and this, just keep building that project. One thing I would add is one thing, you know, I would say that you know, this entire experience has convinced me that the most important thing, that what, what people talk about all the time in academia is their expertise or expertise or expertise. And I'm sort of tired of it. I think we should all lead with what don't I know? What don't I know? What don't I know? It turned out I didn't know a lot. I didn't know a lot. You know, I know things and there's the things I really needed. I didn't know. Megan knew. You know, so maybe also on the other on the other end, I think one of the things that even working with Marcos too, it's like this is a story, this is a collection of stories. So also, how do I, how does Megan and how to how do Marcos use bring their expertise to what they don't know, which is the stories I'm trying to tell, and the form I'm trying to tell them in. So I think if we just kind of start like, what don't I know, and who knows the things I don't know. It's also opened up my appreciation for my colleagues generally on campus who are in digital, d doing digital work. And we've kind of found each other. We have this like little world we've made that's going to spread because the world is digital now, as we all know. 
Well, again, I, I'm just hearing you both talk about your perspectives on your different, you know, angles and, and responsibilities with this project. And I'm thinking of the China Stories project, which is so beautiful, and I can't wait to explore more about that. Um, just how, you know, maybe just this approach with empathy and curiosity coming from both sides is sort of the, the secret sauce, you know. Um, mm -hmm. But if, if you all, we have about 10 minutes left, and I did want to just invite folks again, you can unmute and uh, share questions in chat. If you have them, we do have one question I'd love to get to from Courtney. But um, and if anyone has any other sort of advice, oh, those of you who have worked on these types of projects, if you have other advice you'd like to share while we're here, we'd love to hear it. But I do have a good question from Courtney here. Um, so this is for both of you, and maybe you could give your perspective, but if you imagine a few ways that a, a consortium like Texas Digital Library, which hosts open source infrastructure and also community infrastructure, including digital preservation, how could a consortium, which is made, we're made up of 27 member institutions, hundreds of library and archives workers, and how could some something like this support uh, the Oral History Association? Oh, I mean, I think that there are, there are, there are oral historians who are part of our organization or who come to our, um, conferences who are very expert and who've been doing it far more expert than I am. There are people like me who were just starting out. There are people who are not in academic institutions. And so I think I think kind of in a very ecumenical way, helping, you know, maybe, you know, I've been to one of your conferences, for instance, and it was great. It was like this whole world opened up. That my, I just went, my head exploded, like, oh my God, they're all here in one room and I'm going to learn all this stuff. So I think if there are a way to find ways to maybe, you know, maybe we, as we are collaborating right now, I think it would be really useful for a lot of people to have something where they learn a little bit more about the technical stuff um, around um, 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 archiving, preservation, infrastructure, platforms, that you may go into oral history, think, you know, what you're worried about is what am I going to record with? Is it the right recorder? You know, have I have I got ambient noise here? But then it starts to hit you. Wait a minute! All of this, where's it going to go? How's it going to live? How's it going to survive? And I think it would be wonderful to do workshops and stuff around that. Maybe even as part of the Toha conference, have or the TDL conference, or some some way where we have some of the the sort of technical and um, expertise. Um, sharing, I think, would be from the oral history perspective, would be really welcome. I think that's great advice, and and again, going back to that, you know, you your focus is on what these certain things, but when you start partnering, it broadens what's possible, or it broadens what you knew was even important, or you know, discoverability being something that I'm sure Megan's help uh, or Megan's work helped you with. But Megan, what did you think about that question? Do you have anything to add? Um, I think I'll second, like just helping kind of, as we titled this, bridging the gap of the resources and the education and the, um, you know, I know when I was trained in oral histories, the technology now that you can use is so much different. I was using a recorder with a tape, uh, <laughs> which is very different um, than what you can do now with, um, I remember the first time I had to try to consider using Skype and I was like, this is never going to work. Um, yeah. it's, it actually allowed to connect with somebody who would never, we would, we didn't have the budget to fly. We didn't have, um, the resources to try to get me there. And so using something like Skype allowed us to capture that oral history, but, you know, it's kind of getting that, you know, helping the resources. Cause you know, the other thing too, at smaller institutions, the resources and the, services might be a little different than at the bigger institutions. So kind of helping bridge that gap of the trainings and the resources and the just knowing that you can put stuff in something like the portal or there are, you know, these other digital preservation options um, that are available for you. Oh, that's great. And I agree. And I just wanted to point out, we have just a few minutes left. And if there's any other further questions, I'm seeing some great comments in chat. Um, just uh, mentioning again that the Toha uh, conference is in person, uh, which should be 
kind of like a fun, well, family reunion, a fun family reunion. <laughs> so I do hope um, y'all will check that out. And it's on the can campus of Trinity University, which is such a great campus and um, do hope everyone can have a chance. Um, okay, hi, Adrian. Yes, in person with virtual components. Okay, very cool, very cool. Oh, um, and Courtney's gonna go see you. I did see one question about how does how much does Omega cost? Um, oh, I'm sorry, I missed that. No, it's okay. I saw. Um, so Omeka can vary. It is actually technically free if you have servers to install it on. Um, if you don't have servers to install it on, you can do Omeka.net. Um, and Omeka.net, they will, I think the plans start at $35, depending on your sizes, and they have limitations. There are also a number of hosting services that offer to host Omeka for you, and you get a little bit more kind of options that you can do. Um, and that's what we're doing now. We do another, we use one of the other kind of hosting providers to do our Omeka here. Um, but it does allow you to kind of, um, there are different entry levels and ways that you can do. And that's why I said Omeka is kind of free like a puppy um, because <laughs> if you install it on your own uh, server, you have a lot of care and feeding that you have to do with it. Um, if you let them host it, you're really just getting to kind of put your project in, but you're limited kind of on what settings and things you might be able to do. So I would encourage you to check it out. Um, you're, you can sign up for a free trial. You can try it out and see what it's like if you've never used Omeka. Um, and so there's a lot that you can do kind of to see about that, but it's, it's fun. It's, uh, I think the University of Kentucky runs their entire, they have a big oral history website that's completely built out of oral history and the Bracero project, which is what I showed Jenna when we were trying to show kind of what the software could do. We went and pulled relevant examples of, hey, this is how other oral history projects have used the system. What do you like or don't like about this system? And we were also using Omeka for digital collections. So I could show Jenna the back end and say, okay, this is kind of what you would be using. And this is kind of the language that you have to to, to kind of learn and know what items are or collections mean and all of that. So, but that's kind of what it is. Um, maybe before we go, is it okay if we have a couple of twins here and, and I just, who asked questions and I, I did want to address that if that's okay, even though it's off the Omeka subject. And just to say, you know, please, please feel free to follow up with me by email. I'm happy to talk more about anything, but um, someone asked, why were the twins separated? And I would say that the Chinese international adopt adoption system is not open. So um, there's very, very limited information that Chinese adoptees have or that their adoptive families learn about their origins. Um, it may be that the um, system, which is administered by the Chinese government, um, think maybe the th thinking was it would be harder to place twins. We do have friends who adopted twins. I know two couples who adopted twins, but um, for the most part, it might have come out of concern that it would be harder to place them together. In any event, there are many, many cases now of separated siblings who are finding one another. And I'll say in my interviews that you, every time I asked about birth parents, if, if people were interested in searching for birth parents, um, the, the answer has usually been met with great ambivalence, but then what the adoptee will say unprompted is, I would like to know if I have a sibling. And I think maybe there's something less destabilizing about that. You know, there's not a loyalty test. If you love your adoptive parents and feel disloyal, if you're thinking about your birth parents, but a sibling, you know, there's, there's doesn't present that the same level of concern. So um, there are a number of issues that arise in, in the Chinese adoption system that, and as many of you know, many questions around international adoption that, that you kind of learn from hearing from the adoptees. I'm glad you addressed uh, Innocent's question. That was early on and, and, I, and I'm so glad you remembered to address that and again, I learned so much today, uh, not just about archives and not just about oral history, but I feel like I've got a, a new um, research to the project here with the one with the China stories. So thank you thank both. You. Thank you. Um, 
I think we're gonna, uh, we're after two, so we're gonna end the recording and just wanna say thank you again to Jenna and Megan for taking time to share your expertise and knowledge with us today. It was so fun to get to, to see your presentation and thank you from all of us at TDL. Thank, thank you, you for us. having us. I hope you both have a great day and Thanks. everyone here, take care. We'll see you soon. Okay, take care. Bye.